For the next few weeks, we are engaged in a Lenten study. It matters that it's Lent. We're engaged in a 2021 study. It matters where we are in this time of vulnerable bodies and resurrection hopes. It is Lent and Lent always takes us back to old, old stories, to Jesus entering the wilderness. So we think about uh, Jesus as solitary, as choosing and refusing, as part of Lent, as part of the story of Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. We think of Jesus in the wilderness finding presence, finding divine presence in that solitude. And aren't we in Lent now, <laughs> finding ourselves sometimes more solitary than we're accustomed to, faced with different ways of choosing and refusing. And yet I believe, I feel, I hope, I pray, finding presence, finding divine presence in this Lenten journey. And it's a journey. Our stories, our lectionary texts, our devotions, our thoughts take us on the journey toward Jerusalem, where we find Jesus encountering other fragile selves, children and men and women with infirmities and impairments and questions. We find Jesus traveling in company with some fearful selves, disciples trailing down the road behind him. We find him and the exercise of social power and its abuses is part of Lent. And so we're keeping company with Jesus and the bodies around him in all the ways they showed and lived compassion and care and dread and resolve. And oh my goodness, isn't it 2021? Um, and we head in Lent toward its culmination in an excruciating death and a story of resurrection. We are heading in Lent toward an end that is a beginning that for Christians since the very beginning has been held to be a singular mystery, something about Jesus of Nazareth, and yet something that changed the world. Um, so Lent then and Lent now shapes our study. So what I proposed and what Catherine let us take the plunge into is a Lenten study of what some early Christians thought about the resurrection. So each week I plan to pair a New Testament writer with a later writer who may be less familiar. So today I have some verses from Paul's letter to the first Corinthians, Paul's first Corinthian letter, um, for specifically from chapter 15 um, for us to think about together, paired with a probably second century writer that we know very little about, his name Athenagoras. He's kind of a philosophic writer. Um, he only left us, if it's the same writer on two treatises, he only left us two essays and we know very little about his biography. But I find him really interesting and I hope you will too. So I want to be clear, my goal this week, our goal for the next few weeks is not to debate or try to settle questions about the afterlife. So maybe we could anchor ourselves in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. I quite love this verse. Beloved, we are God's children now. So let's just hang on to that. That part we know. We don't always feel it experientially as much as we do at other times. But right now, we're the children of God. We look around us at other humans. We say we are the children, God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. So the purpose of our next few weeks is not to try and preempt the mystery that hasn't been revealed to us. What we do know 
this writer says is this, when Jesus is revealed, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. So somehow being God's children now is the promise of being God's children after death. And that somehow means being even more fully like Jesus. So we're not trying to settle what the afterlife's like. We have no data, um, no evidence, no empirical approach, but we do know, we do have texts, we do have our understanding of ourselves as God, God's children. And we do have the traditions about the mystery of the resurrection that come to us. These are places I think where early Christians were wrestling with their embodied struggles in their own lives. So I think in early Christians explorations of death and resurrection, we can see things about how they were wrestling with fragility and fear, with power and justice, with compassion and care, with dread and resolve, those Lenten kinds of themes. They're wrestling with what it means to be human facing into death. So it's a historical study for us to do in 2021, but it's a story that I hope is relevant to our questions and vulnerabilities. So I've been really interested um, lately in how various artists are exploring our time, the time in which we find ourselves, the sense of how what life means when we are surrounded by a frightening pandemic, what life means when we're adjusting to it, and what life means as we watch increasing rates of death in our society and around the world. So I have three pandemic images. This first one comes from um, a PhD neuroscientist who is now part of a group that presents science illustrations. She was featured in the last couple of, tomorrow is International Day of the Woman. And so she was featured in a BBC article about female artists helping us understand our time and place. So would you use the chat and maybe Catherine can help me because sometimes when I'm screen sharing, I can't see the chat very well. And in this image of vulnerable life and change life in our time, just comment, what's something you see? What's something you see? Would you offer that in the chat? Zippers that can't be closed, a table set for three but empty, a Zoom meeting, a spiky dangerous virus, DNA unraveling, reproducing, everyone on screens, Hollywood squares, a virus, a zipper, Netflix. These seem pretty real to me. Three cups, who else is home? Yeah. So from her palette, or pulling from your own. When you think, check in with yourself, your embodied self this morning, what color would you choose to represent how you are this morning? Will you put that in the chat? It's a pretty low stakes question, but I wanna see what palette we're working with, yellow. Green. 
I hope you're opening the chat function so you can watch. Um, also, Catherine, will you read some of them? Of course. Dark blue, purple, green, indigo, purple, yellow, red, and green. So same question, different illustration. Um, last summer, the Washington Post did a feature on art of the pandemic. And so this one and the next one come from that um, selection. Uh, charcoal, I think, named Doctor. What do you see? Concern. Somber, serious, fatigue, brown, tired, worry, intense focus, a tired eye, eyes very dark, her eyes very dark, heavy, face obscured, protection, compassion, sad eyes, resolve. That's remarkable. Vulnerable bodies, we're surrounded by them. And these eyes, I believe, are represented as gazing upon vulnerable bodies in our time. Same question, one more image, if you will. This one, a little more abstract, but there's a hint of a figure. The artist also featured in the Washington Post, post pardon me, Elizabeth Lana calls this moody little guy, an offering of pandemic art. What do you see? Chaos. Patches of darkness among the light, questioning, black cat, an EKG, disunity, scattered, Chinese characters, unsettled. I think I love exercises like this because others help me see. Um, mm, another, <laughs> yeah, Rachel Wiggins, social distancing. Yeah, we are in a time of acute awareness of vulnerable bodies, also heroic resolved bodies of chaos and color and uncertainty. And so let's take where we are as these artists help us feel and see it. And um, Cindy Cass Stevens, yeah, a life interrupted, a life interrupted. Cindy's given me the perfect segue that doesn't mean no one else can put in the chat, but um, <clears throat> a life interrupted. In the first, second, and third centuries of the emergence of the movement around Jesus, there were different beliefs about the human self and death, uh, different beliefs about what happened when life was interrupted in death. And there was an available philosophic option that all parts of the human self end at death. For That is not a position that Christians took. They typically argued against it. It doesn't mean there weren't Christians who believed it, that that was likely and that their faith was of most value to them in this life. 
Um, but it isn't a position that got explored in writing. And it isn't a position that seemed to make sense of the events of Jesus life, death and resurrection. But there still were varied views and I'm going to highlight some of those in the weeks to come. Um, early Christians didn't agree among themselves about something so mysterious, even if they shared some reference points in how they thought. So there were views in the first few centuries that saw the human self. There were different ways of talking about what makes up the human self, right? Heart, soul, mind, and strength, soul, body, spirit. There wasn't one anthropology among Christians, one way of understanding the human self. But it was pretty common in the ancient world to speak of souls and bodies in some way as partners or as opposites. And so there were some Christians in the first centuries who spoke about the soul as being the essential part of the human self and the body as inessential who spoke of the soul as the permanent part of us and the body as the impermanent part of us. So the soul would be the true self and the body, the false self in this way of thinking. And so the soul is imprisoned in this way of thinking. The body becomes the prison. And therefore death, that interruption, is the escape of the soul from the body into the essential permanent truth of freedom in the presence of God, and the body is left behind to decay. Um, it's worth knowing that this kind of view was expressed in some parts of groups that were following Jesus in the first few centuries, but it's a minority view. Um, Late in later eras, it became a more typical view within Christianity, um, but it isn't the predominant view and it isn't the view of either Paul or Athenagoras, uh, to whom I'll introduce you. It maybe it hangs in some of our hymns, this 19th century sweet hour of prayer has the line, this robe of flesh, I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize. So the eye there is the part that's rising and leaving the flesh behind. Um, so this kind of view of the separability of the body and soul and the lower status of the body um, hangs on in Christianity. It's not, it may not be the view of this hymn writer if then there was a verse that didn't get written that said, and at the resurrection of all things, the robe of flesh will be reconstituted and reunited with the soul, but the hymn doesn't say that. So I don't know really what the hymn writer thought. Paul and Athenagoras, these two writers we're touching on today, had a more unified view of the human self. And so they did see death as an interruption, but a temporary interruption in the, the way the self is a unified body and soul. For Paul and Athenagoras in different ways, the care of God and the memory of God sees a person as both body and soul and preserves the whole person. And in the ultimate destiny is to have the whole person reunited. So for many early, most early Christians, I would argue, um, the resurrection of Jesus is not just a singular event. It tells us that all believers escape death as a finality. And for many early Christians, they believed the resurrection of Jesus anticipated not just the resurrection of believers' spirits or souls, or but something like a body so both Paul and Athenagoras explored their position in complicated ways. So I just want to highlight two themes. They see this view, their view of the resurrection of bodies in some ultimate time as about how God continues to, to combine change and permanence 
and they see it as an issue of justice and ethics, or it's tied to how they wrestle with questions of justice and ethics in their time. So about change. In 1 Corinthians 15, one of the things Paul um, is tangling with is that other in probably insiders, probably in the Christian movement, find the idea of resurrecting bodies um, distasteful and crude. So somebody's saying, you know, are you talking about a zombie apocalypse? Are you talking about resuscitating corpses? Um, what kind of body would that be? And Paul, with his usual tact, calls this a foolish question. Um, and uses the analogy of a seed. So a resurrected body isn't like our body. It's like if you look at a seed, you can't tell unless you're extremely experienced as a gardener, what kind of plant is going to come from that. Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Um, the seed sheds its casing to germinate. As for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he's chosen and to each kind of seed, its own body. So there's continuity in the body in this life and the ultimate body that will be resurrected at the end of time in Paul's view. Um, but you can't look at what is now and predict what will be later. Because there are all kinds of bodies. You would call a star a body, even if it's made of gas and gives off light. Um, so the body that it waits in the future has a kind of glory that's different from this um, life. Paul is like other philosophic thinkers of his time in thinking of the soul not as immaterial, but as made of super refined stuff, really thin stuff that can endure after death. And yet it's right still to call it a body, even though it's so fine. So the philosopher Epicurus talked about the spirit as a fine textured body which is like breath or like warmth. So Paul's not talking zombies. He's talking about something super refined, but it's still for some reason important to him to call it a body, not something else. In fact, he makes up kind of a new term about a spiritual body, um, that in this life we have a natural body but there is something, not a disembodied soul, the body part matters to Paul to talk about there is a spiritual body in the resurrection. Another translation I quite like from the Jerusalem Bible, when it is sown, it embodies the soul. So we have a soul body at the time when we die, but when we're raised, we'll have a spirit body but Paul still wants to use the language of embodiment and not leave the body behind. So too does this later writer Athenagoras. He, he, in his view, the resurrection won't involve the changeable parts of humans. So he has quite a long passage where he rules out there will be no earth, fire, air, earth, sorry, air, fire, earth, or water in the resurrected body. The resurrected body won't be warm and moist, warm and dry, cold and dry, cold and moist. Um, all the doctors on the call, all the medical professionals on the call, these were key medical categories um, for diagnosis and treatment in the ancient world. Um, so there won't be blood, yellow bile, black bile, or phlegm in resurrected bodies, in case anyone was wondering, according to Athenagoras. The really interesting thing about this, one of the interesting things about this early Christian thinker is he uses the word parts. He wants to say whatever the self is ultimately, 
it still has its recognizable parts, that there's some kind of signifiers of identity for human individuals, and he is talking about individuals, um, that will be stable in the afterlife. So this may not be so surprising to us. I think we, if we sense, if we sense that someone we love is gone and yet somehow present in their absence, we think of them as enduring as themselves. But in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to show you some other early Christian writers who really wondered if gen or if gender continues in the afterlife, if individual relationships matter in the afterlife, if bodies are perfected in the afterlife, then what happened to the bodies that we lived with in, in this life? So Athenagoras interests me for the ways he says, no, there are stable signifiers of identity parts of the self now that are still going to be there ultimately. But you can hear him not thinking about an afterlife as an escape from how changeful life is. You can hear Athenagoras, I think, coming to the terms with how much change is life brings. We are not promised now or ultimately an unshaken permanence. But we, we do want it. We'd like things to be more permanent. We'd like things to stabilize and be more stable in life. But here's an early Christian thinker grappling with how shaky life can be, how, in, how many interruptions, how much change um, life brings. And yet in this life, we are held in the care of God. So for him to think that will that change will continue after death is a way of him saying God is consistent and we're made in the image of God. So he doesn't think our longing for permanence is just wish fulfillment or denial. The fact that we are made in the image of God for Athenagoras means our life isn't just to be kindled for a brief space and then snuffed out. We lost a recent alum from my college this week and the sense that sometimes lives seem to be kindled for too brief a space is painful. And so somehow it's meaningful to me to find an ancient thinker grappling with that and saying, no, humans are made in the image of God. So that's an assurance that there's a continuation for Athenagoras. He is a little more daring than Paul even. He uses a kind of seed metaphor like Paul does, but he doesn't make it plants. He actually is fairly graphic in some places about the physical constitution of semen. When you looked at something liquid, could you predict the infant that would come? Can you predict from an infant the qualities of grown-ups? As a newly engaged, fascinated grandmother, I think so. I think I can look at an infant and predict qualities of a grown-up, but I can't really. And then you also hear in Athenagoras his sensitivity to the changefulness of life, nor can we predict in adult age, those of, I kept men, but I think he means the women too. We seem to be aging also. Humans who are aging, nor finally the breakup of bodies that are worn out. But if God as creator can put body and soul together when a baby is conceived, Athenagoras says, God as creator can put body and soul together in a further stage of life that we can't imagine and we can't predict, but for him, we can count on it. 
Both of them also, both Paul and Athenagoras in various ways connect their belief that it's not just that souls live after death, but that God will resurrect bodies to the ways that bodies and souls matter in this life. So Paul briefly at the end of chapter 15 says all this theo theologizing he's doing about resurrected bodies is because bodies matter. Work matters. What you're doing for God now matters. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast and movable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Athenagoras says more. To Athenagoras, it really matters that bodies be resurrected at the end of time and reunited with their souls for judgment. And he isn't actually very focused on because we've all committed sins and we have to be judged for them, or he is not an early Christian writer that paints a picture of um, punishment in any vivid ways. But he does think there are evils that happen in society and in this world that are not rectified in this life and demand accountability and judgment. He talks about rulers who kill masses of people or burn whole cities or exploit the vulnerable in systematic ways. Um, Athenagoras is not a bad introduction to the study Catherine and Mark Jensen will lead on Tuesday night with the cross and the lynching tree by James Cone. So for Athenagoras, bodies have to be resurrected because it's not just souls that do those things. Souls don't burn cities. Um, souls don't do extreme evil. But he's fascinating to me in the way he talks about how it's not our souls that do good either. It's our bodies. So he takes up some of the classical virtues of the ancient world. He does all four of the classical virtues. I've only listed three here. But in his language, you can hear how much he thinks the ways we are trying to live in, the ways he was trying to live and others in his time were trying to live were deeply embodied um, challenges. So souls and bodies have to be rewarded for virtue because souls don't accomplish virtue without the bodies. So for Athenagoras, courage and endurance can't exist in a soul. You can't have courage and endurance apart from the fear of death or apart from wounds or maiming or maltreatment or pain. You can't have courage and endurance be rewarded in souls without the bodies in which those virtues self-control without food and sex in front of you. That's kind of his view. But self-control and temperance don't exist without embodied choices. And so how in any sense can justice be an attribute of souls, either in their relation with each other or some other being like or unlike them? A work of art at the end. So back to the chat, if you will, and then I'm going to ask what questions or comments you have based on this textual overview. The pictures are easier to interact with. Here's a piece of art from a time when plagues and famine were really common in Rome from a funeral area in the catacomb of St. Priscilla. What do you see here? infant welcoming blood another prayer for Life. healing <laughs> is someone dying on the left birth death 
resurrection. A leader. Yeah. And I'll add that is a female depiction. That's a woman in the center. Receptive to grace. A prayer shawl. Yeah. Yeah. Again, thank you for helping me see things, even when I choose the image and have looked at it a long time. I think we're meant to see things together. Um, there are interpreters of these prayerful figures in catacomb paintings who see them as depictions of women leading, um, but prayer leading in response to the fragility of birth and death, communities that get interrupted by death. Um, there are also some art historians who see that central figure as an image of an embodied soul, that that's the soul in the presence of God holding together the earthly community and God's own care and love. But the only way to paint a picture of a soul is with a body. But there's a truth there um, for the early Christians that souls would have some kind of tangible form and continuity. 